Now, there's been some big mechanical changes, whether it's monsters or some of these playable races, there's been a lot of change there as well, correct? So the amount of change in the book varies creature by creature and uh, playable race by playable race. But there are some common themes. So first with the races, uh, as with all the changes in the book, there are really two components, changes on the story side and changes on the mechanical side, and then how those two uh, uh, influence each other. So one of the big changes that we have been telling people for a while uh, was going to be coming in uh, races in our books. You'll see that none of these 33 races has a uh, predetermined ability score adjustment in it. Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been telling people that this is coming. Uh, you'll still get to adjust your ability scores but that adjustment now exists as a part of the ability score determination step of character creation rather than it being a component of your race. Right. Uh, we have made this change and have been working on this for quite some time because we actually started work on Monsters of the Multiverse like year before last, you know, right. because the, the way the way printing timelines go and our production timelines, it's like this is almost like ancient history when we made this book. Right. Uh, and uh, one of the big reasons why uh, we made this change is we've been unsatisfied for years that race has an outsized effect on many players' choice of class mm, yeah. for their character. Because many players looked at those ability score in increases. Say, uh, one race might give them a bonus to wisdom, for instance, where another gives them a bonus to dexterity. And let's say they want to play a rogue, and so then suddenly many players will limit themselves to considering only the races that give them a bonus to dexterity. Or if, say, they wanted to play a cleric or a druid, they might look only at the races that give them a bonus to wisdom. Right. That's not our intent as game designers for, for race and class to be, the, for your decision as a player to be sort of wrapped up together. We want you to be able to pick the two you want and marry them to create the character that's going to give you the most bliss at the table. And that's why we've moved ability score adjustments uh, outside uh, of the races. We also had story reasons for doing it. Uh, the, the ability score adjustments were giving the incorrect perception that like all members of this race are more dexterous than the typical member of another race, or right. all members of this one are smarter than the typical members of another. That's not the impression we want to give because the individuals in every one of these groups are just as varied as humans are. And any kind of implication that everyone is sort of at least at the start wired the same way mm -hmm. is simply not in keeping with how characters have actually been portrayed in D&D storytelling for years. So we wanted to get our game design in sync with our storytelling and get those sort of inbuilt assumptions out. Even though we knew, and this is actually important for people to realize, those bonuses in a way were always uh, only very significant at early levels. Because in our game, there's an ability score maximum. Yeah. Meaning, and this has been true for all of fifth edition, even when those bonuses were in play, at higher levels, a halfling can be just as strong as an orc. And that's been true for all of 5th edition. But even though we knew that, that the, the mathematical impact of having those built-in bonuses was not as large as sometimes people thought, what we again saw is that those, those bonuses were having an outsized influence on people's class choice and just how they were in the story perceiving these different groups, right. and and we're just like we just need to get this out of there because it's it, it's a distraction. I mean, very hard for me not to play a half elf or a tiefling as a warlock, right? Right. <laughs> and and we want you to play any type of you know person that you want to pair with 
warlock yeah. that sings to you, you know, if you decide you want to play a dwarf warlock, we don't want our race design to sort of put a hand on the scale. Um, now, the races are still filled with uh, wonderful distinctiveness, and in fact, many of these races have new traits uh, in this book. Uh, and that arose because this is the first time uh, these races have all appeared together in one place, and one of our design goals was to make it so that they truly felt like, as game options, that they were standing shoulder to shoulder. Meaning, we wanted each of them to feel like they were going to offer you things that were similarly weighty. Now, I don't mean that they're all sort of balanced in the sense of like, they will all give you the same boost to damage or all give you the same boost to some other characteristic. Often in our game, which is about asymmetrical balance, it's about, we wanted all of them to feel like they will modify your character in similarly meaningful ways. Uh, and you're gonna find, uh, as you go through this book, a lot of fun surprises, uh, including just even the elves in this book, their trance works in a new, uh, wonderful way. Uh, That's what I was surprised about this book, were the amount of changes to all the playable races, and and I was also delighted, like to find like, oh, this is it's nice to like have like these new options and these new abilities that did not exist there before, or get to use them more often, and and so those little adjustments. Yeah, it, very much like the Dragonborn as presented in Fizz Bands in yes. some ways. Yeah. And, and, and what we've been doing in all of that race design is looking at the story of each of these peoples and seeing what neat mythical or magical thing about them has the game often said, sometimes for decades and multiple editions, about this people, but has never actually delivered in the game design. Uh, and so, Going back to the elf and the trance, this is a great example where in our storytelling uh, for multiple editions when we talk about trance for among elves, we've talked about the fact that in that trance, they sometimes dip into the elven shared unconscious. And we thought, why don't we actually give that game design teeth? And so that's why now the elves in Monsters of the Multiverse, when they trance, can actually connect with their elf ancestors and then exit the trance with uh, a proficiency they didn't have before. And this is something they can do day by day. So now instead of elves just having maybe a default weapon proficiency, for instance, you actually have the option of adjusting certain proficiencies each time you emerge from your trance because of the communication you had uh, with you know, the, the elves of yore stretching all the way back to Corallon, uh, the, you know, the god who was the progenitor of all elves. We, we, we've seen this all cha these changes that are, are lovely, but some of them were kind of, you know, telegraphed by UA where we've got kobolds who, like, I, I, like, I like them a lot better now, I'll be honest. <laughs> like, they're really fun now. They've got kind of that... that that, that short dragon energy going on. Uh, I really appreciate that kind of stuff. And, and goblins have being able to use like the fury of the small a bit more, yeah. but in a, in a different different way. Yeah, uh, not as powerful, but more often. And and that the kobold, uh, the hobgoblin as well in this book, uh, appeared in Unearthed Arcana last year, and they were always aimed for this book. We will sometimes, I've talked about this before, we will sometimes mix things that are actually destined for different books in the same Unearthed Arcana. And so back when we uh, released that Kobold UA, people pondered, oh, later, especially when Fizbins came out, oh, was this meant for the Treasury of Dragons and got cut? And like, no, this was actually always headed for Monsters of the Multiverse. And thankfully, uh, the feedback to the kobold as well as to the hobgoblin, uh, super positive. And so we felt confident presenting uh, those as the new versions of these playable options. Uh, and 
The cobalt was a particularly fun bit of design because we realized working on the cobalt that their story has shifted enough uh, over the decades in D and D, where you know sometimes they're associated with dragons, sometimes not at all. That we decided, at least in their case, to provide you a trait choice so that you get to sort of customize the type of kobold you are uh, when you decide to play one of uh, those those little dragon folk. And like you, I love their sort of like fierce little dragon energy. Uh, th- this is another thing I love about the hobgoblins too. Now it's not just about uh, where mechanically it was kind of about being embarrassed and succeeding on a roll despite it. Now it's very, though militaristic, very, very good for your party. <laughs> Well, and, and we were not only able to enhance the Hobgoblin's sort of game mechanics and, yeah. and how they benefit your party, but our game design there was really influenced also by the story work that we were doing. Because previously, the Hobgoblin's traits were largely cultural. Uh, there were certain sort of assumptions about what Hobgoblins are like culturally, and then their traits reflected that. Our races no longer include just pure cultural traits because a player character can really grow up in any culture, Mm -hmm. in any region, on any world. And so it was critical for us as we revisited each of these race options, including the Hobgoblin, to really drill into what is specific to them physically, magically, and mythically. And so our hook for the Hobgoblins was actually that deep... Feywild history we talked about and the mystical gifts that they were given uh, in their ancient days in the Feywild, gifts that the ancestors, I mean the descendants now, you know, millennia later still have. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, it, And it doesn't actually matter what the individual hobgoblin's culture is, they're able to tap into these mystical gifts uh, that their ancestors received in the Feywild uh, millennia ago. If you liked this interview and you'd like to see more, go ahead and like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that little bell symbol so you're notified anytime a video like this comes out. Thank you so much for watching.